We're moving on in section two to look at combining the three gas laws. What if you need to know what happens to the gas when two of the three parameters, pressure, volume, and temperature change? You can deal with this situation by combining the three equations that express Boyle's, Charles, and Guy Lussac's law. Let's check this out. P1V1 equals P2V2 is Boyle's law. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2 is Charles's law. And P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2 is Guy Lussac's law. So when we put all three of these together and smush Boyle's, Charles, and Guy Lussac's all into one, we get P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. So we combine all of the gas laws. And again, we're not changing the amount of gas or the moles or the particles in there. Let's look at a demonstration example of this. The combined gas law incorporates the three laws of gases into a single equation and shows the relationship between the volume, pressure, and temperature of a set amount of gas. The equipment you're going to need for this episode includes a flask or bottle with an opening just smaller than your egg, a couple of hard boiled eggs with shells removed, butane lighter, a couple of paper strips, and because we're dealing with fire, a fire extinguisher. The only steps for this experiment are to light your piece of paper with your butane lighter, let it catch fire a little bit first, so it's nice and hot, drop it into your beaker and place your egg over the top. Yay! Let's try that again, this time with a glass bottle. To remove your egg from your bottle, use heat resistant gloves or tongs and hold your bottle upside down over some boiling water, with the egg covering the opening. As the air inside the bottle heats up, it's going to force the egg into the opening. Once it gets stuck into the opening, flip it right side up and continue to heat the bottle until the egg pops out the top. Let's look at this experiment a little closer. This experiment is a great example of the combined gas law, which combines the three laws of gases, Charles' law, Boyle's law, and gay lussacs law, and states that the temperature, pressure, and volume of a gas are related. To learn more about the three laws of gases, check out our other videos. Normally, when you place an egg on top of the bottle, it won't fit through the bottle's opening because the egg's diameter is larger than the opening of the bottle. Since the pressure inside and outside of the bottle are the same, the only force that pushes the egg into the bottle is gravity, but gravity isn't strong enough. Our bottle is full of air molecules. When we drop the flaming piece of paper into the bottle and seal the opening with the egg, the flaming paper heats up the air molecules inside the bottle. When a gas like air is heated, the molecules move faster and try to spread further apart, but because the air is trapped inside the bottle, the volume of space that it can take up is limited. Once the air has filled the volume of the bottle and cannot spread any further apart, the air molecules start to press against the walls of the bottle, and since the walls won't move, the air pressure inside the bottle increases rapidly. As the pressure and temperature of the air inside the bottle increases, some of the oxygen molecules are used in combustion, creating the products carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Once the pressure inside the bottle is strong enough, it will cause the egg to jump up and down and allow the air to rush out into the environment. Both of these processes reduce the amount of air inside the bottle, but because the air is extremely hot, its volume still fills the bottle and the high pressure remains. Once the majority of the air molecules have escaped the bottle or are used in combustion, the flame of the paper will extinguish. Once this happens, the air inside the bottle will begin to cool, reducing in volume and pressure. But because we have far less air molecules inside the bottle than when we started, the pressure inside the bottle drops much lower than at the start of the experiment. Because the pressure outside our bottle is higher than inside our bottle, the force the outside pressure exerts on our egg is strong enough to gently push the egg through the small opening and into the bottle. Once the egg is in the bottle, the seal preventing air from entering the bottle is gone, and air rushes in, balancing the pressure inside and outside of the bottle. The opposite effect occurs when we remove the egg from the bottle. As we heat the air in the bottle, the pressure inside gets much higher than the pressure outside. 
the higher inside pressure generates a much stronger force than the pressure outside of the bottle, gently pushing the egg through the opening of the bottle, until the egg shoots out of the opening, allowing the air to rush out, balancing the pressure inside and outside of the bottle. Let's do an example with a combined gas loss. You have a sample of carbon dioxide in flask A with a volume of 25 milliliters, so this will be our V1, at 20.5 degrees Celsius, that's our T1, we need to convert it to Kelvin, so plus 273.15. And the pressure of the gas is 436.5 millimeters of mercury, that's my P1. To find the volume of another flask B, so this is my V2, which is question mark, you move the CO2 to that flask and find that its pressure is now 94.3 millimeters of mercury, so that's P2, at 24.5 degrees Celsius, that's T2. What is the volume of flask B? We have a lot of variables here. Notice that I have a pressure, a volume, and a temperature of an initial, a pressure, a temperature, and I need to find the volume of the second one. So that is a combined gas law. Let's write it out. P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. Our unknown is going to be this V2. Let's write in what we know. I put in all of the variables that we knew. P1 times V1 over T1 equals P2 times V2 over T2. So since we're dealing with fractions again, and I don't like looking at fractions, I want to make it a linear problem. So I'm going to multiply diagonally, so 436.5 times 25 times 297.7. Let's see what that gives us. It's okay if it's a really big number. I got 3,248,651.25. Okay, now let's cross multiply the other direction. I'm going to do 293.7 times 94.3 times V2 to give me 27,695.91, but remember that V2 is still there. So I did these three times each other and those three times each other. I'm still cross multiplying. And now to get V2 by itself, I need to divide both sides by that 27,000 number to get. And that should give me a V2 with three significant figures of 117 milliliters. Let's try another one. See if you can fill in the variables that were given. Here's what I got. I got a P1, a V1, and a T1. Make sure you convert to Kelvin a P2 and a T2, and we need to find V2. What will the volume be? Let's set it up. Now the last time I plugged in all of my numbers and then simplified, but you might prefer to solve for V2 and then plug your numbers in. So let's do that. I'm gonna cross multiply and say P2 times V2 times T1, that's in my diagonal, is equal to P1 times V1 times T2. Now let's solve for V2. In order to get V2 by itself, I have to divide both sides by P2 and T1. That'll get rid of both of those. Now we can put in the V2 is P1 V1 T2 over P2 times T1. And we know all of those variables. Let's plug it in. There we go. I've got all of my numbers plugged in, so let's do the total top divided by total bottom, and we should get, my calculator is spitting out to me with three significant figures, 3.38 times 10 to the fourth liters. If you wanted to write that out in long form, it'd be 338 with two zeros after it, so 33,800 liters. How did you do? Here's our last example for the combined gas law. See if you can fill in the variables. Here's everything I was given from the problem. I was told that I had 22 liter cylinder of helium, so that's my volume, at a pressure of 150 atmospheres and at 31 degrees Celsius. So I have all of my pressure, volume, and temperatures. How many balloons can you fill if each balloon has a volume of five liters? Well, I need to figure out what total volume I would get before I figure that out. On a day when the atmospheric pressure is 755 millimeters of mercury, so I'm given a P2, and the temperature is 22 degrees Celsius. The first problem I see 
is that my P1 is in atmospheres and my P2 is in millimeters of mercury. We need to get them to the same unit. It doesn't matter if you want to get your atmospheres into millimeters of mercury or millimeters of mercury into atmospheres. I like atmospheres better. I'm just going to do this and say that there's 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere. That gave me 0.9934 atmospheres. And I just converted my temperatures into Kelvin. Now let's plug in our combined gas law. I've got my P1 times V1 divided by T1 equals P2 times V2 divided by T2. I'm going to cross multiply and do 304 times 0.9934 times V2 and 150 times 22 times 295. That should give me this. And then to solve for V2, I need to divide both sides by that 301.9936, which I got by multiplying 304 times the 0.9934, because that's attached to V2. For V2, with two significant figures, I got 3,200 liters. But we're not quite done. It wants to know how many balloons we can fill, and each balloon has a volume of 5.0 liters. So let's divide this by 5.0 liters to figure out how many balloons we can fill. And I got 640 balloons. This is the last piece of the section, Avogadro's hypothesis. We're looking at the relationship between volume and the amount of gas that was first noted by Amadeo Avogadro. He proposed that equal volumes of gases under the same conditions of temperature and pressure have equal numbers of particles. So the volume of a gas at a given temperature and pressure is directly proportional to the amount of gas. And we can use stoichiometry to do this. So equal amounts of gases, the moles of different gases, at the same temperature and pressure occupy equal volumes. Dinitrogen monoxide, commonly known as laughing gas, is used in dental procedures as an anesthetic. At elevated temperatures and with the proper catalyst, dinitrogen monoxide can be produced from the reaction of ammonia and oxygen as follows. If you begin with 15 liters of NH3, what volume of oxygen is required for complete reaction? What is the theoretical yield of N2O in liters under the same conditions? So all we're given here is that we have 15.0 liters of NH3. Well, we can use stoichiometry. We said before that if I compared one reactant to another reactant, we used a mole-to-mole -mole ratio. But now we're saying that equal amounts of gases in moles at the same temperature and pressure occupy equal volumes. So if I have two moles of NH3 and two moles of O2, that would be like occupying two liters and two liters. They will be that same mole to mole ratio as liters to liters ratio. So I can say I have two liters of NH3. Again, this is only for gases. Two liters of O2. 15 times 2 divided by 2 is going to be 15 liters of oxygen that's required for this reaction. Now let's start with that same 15 liters of NH3 and we want to know how much N2O in liters will be produced theoretically. Well for every 2 liters of NH3 I have to have that on the bottom to cancel out liters and liters. I create one mole or one liter of N2O. So 15 times 1 divided by 2 should give me 7.50 liters of N2O produced. Try to do this one. We know that methane can be combusted in this reaction, so we have oxygen, to create CO2 and H2O. If we start with 22.4 liters of methane, what volume of oxygen is required and what volume of our products will be produced? We are assuming that they are all gases and that all gases have the same temperature and pressure. The first one, going from CH4 to O2, we had a 1 to 2 ratio. Again, make sure that your units diagonal cancel out. So I should need 44.8 liters of oxygen. 
to see how much CO2 is produced. I started with that 22.4 liters. It's a one to one ratio. So 22.4 liters of carbon dioxide would be produced. And the last one, starting with 22.4 liters of CH4, it's a one to two, so one to two ratio to get to water. So I'd have 44.8 liters of water produced. And that wraps up section two.